Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing fine. So the usual question, can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Great to hear. Well, mm -hmm. thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar. My name is uh, Jörn Ellefsen, and I am the CEO at Innofactor Norway. I will be moderating today's webinar. I would like to welcome my peers at Microsoft, Jessica Perez, Cloud Solution Architect, and Henry Hagnas, Azure Data Center Lead, as well as our principal consultant and Kubernetes expert, Ryan Irijo. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So please drop your question in the Q&A box and we'll answer your questions at the end of the session. I will now give the floor to Jessica and Henry to kick off today's presentation. Take it away, please. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Jörg. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Jessica Perez, a Cloud Solution Architect working at Microsoft Norway, and I'm glad to hear, uh, today, be here today with you. Today, we will go through a small agenda, which is only about uh, taking you through why, uh, what we have in Kubernetes on Azure, some top scenarios and some customer stories with my colleague, Henry. So why Kubernetes on Azure? What, what, what we have is a, an enterprise grade by design solution, which is built in best practices. It has some multi-layer security and operational efficiency, and you can get an unified management. So this enterprise grade by design is made like in a whole ecosystem because you can use the development tools that you already used as GitHub, as Visual Studio Code, or a different IDs. You can use also a different services that you already are uh, familiar in our Azure platform as Active Directory, Azure Policy, and you also can uh, use or have an integration with projects built by the community around Kubernetes, such as Virtual Kubelet and Helm or Draft. We are bringing you the best practices from 1,000 and more of enterprise engagements, 3,000 security experts focus on your data security and privacy, and 24 seven for 365 days on call support backend by experts on Kubernetes. We are also the uh, the cloud provider with more regions than any other available with Kubernetes than any other cloud provider. With uh, the use of Azure Advisor, you can have a proactive and actionable recommendations for your specific cluster and workloads deployed on your Azure subscription. So then with this, you have the, the ability to improve your performance, your security before any issue or problem exists. So this is really good that, that Azure can uh, provide you with this kind of uh, real-time advisor. So you, can, you also get multi-layer security. You can use Azure policy to enforce the deployments to the cluster. You can use fine-grained active uh, identity and access management with the use of Azure Active Directory. You can uh, get an overall about your, the cluster security with the integration with Azure Security. And you have a lot of different other services uh, which enhance the security of your cluster. We will go through this in a more uh, detailed way a bit uh, later. You can also, as I mentioned before, use Trust uh, Azure Advisor to get real-time um, advices 
over your cluster, you have also real time log logs uh, in your for your images deployed in your cluster, how everything is going in your application through the use of Azure Monitor. You can also uh, elastically add more compute with the use of virtual node, which is serverless Kubernetes. And you have uh, also can have a disaster recovery with the use of different regions to deploy your cluster. You can have a unified management uh, experience to the use of ARC, Azure ARC, which is a, a service where you can manage cluster, Kubernetes cluster that can be deployed on Azure, on-premise, or even in a different cloud providers. Azure ARC has the ability to manage and govern all these uh, clusters in only one tool. And we are seeing uh, Azure Kubernetes services, it's having a momentum. It's the fastest growing compute service on Azure, and we have the trust, we have been trusted uh, for by thousands of our customers. In a, a, a bit later, uh, Henry we will take us through some specific uh, scenarios with our customers. So for Azure Kubernetes service, we have these top scenarios, which is lift and ship is the most common. Uh, we have also uh, microservices to provide the agility and faster application development. We have uh, secure DevOps with the automation that is needed, some data streaming with real-time uh, data analytics. We can provide or you can use also Kubernetes to, in your IoT scenarios. And of course, we can, uh, you can use uh, Azure Kubernetes service to, to, for your machine learning scenarios and also for MLOps. So the, the first uh, top scenario is lift and shift to containers, which it can be used to modernize your application without any code change. So you can just wrap your existing application as a container, deploy it to Azure Container Registry, use Azure Pipelines to provide continuous integration and continuous deployment to the cluster, and with Azure uh, Azure Active Directory, you can uh, grant uh, role-based success control to, do, to that application. You can also integrate uh, with uh, managed databases that, uh, by example, can be uh, MySQL, but you can use also use Cosmos DB, Postgres DB, according to what you are using uh, before the modernization and is needed by your specific workload. Another of the, the most common scenarios is microservice for faster app development. So you can uh, implement the inner loop of the application development and uh, test and the book with uh, an AKS cluster and the Visual Studio Code plugins. You can also have uh, the source code control with GitHub, with the integration with GitHub, you can also use the Azure pipelines to produce the integration, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So then you also can have an elastically growing with the virtual nodes, with the use of virtual nodes. So then for those kind of workloads that are uh, kind of unpredictable, this uh, how they will behave in traffic and in, in so you can use uh, or you can add compute with the use of virtual nodes, which is an implementation of virtual kubelet. So then it's uh, you can cover uh, uh, to scale out elastically. You can also have uh, the or can use Azure Monitor to get the insights for your application, for the entire cluster, for the images, and for uh, the nodes. 
you can also implement uh, uh, Azure, uh, sorry, uh, secure DevOps scenarios. Uh, you can have, as I mentioned before, the inner uh, loop of uh, the deployments and the, the code. You can also add source control with GitHub. You, by default, you have an Azure, in Azure Containers Registry, all the images are scanned. So once that's, once that you upload an image through your uh, container registry, the image is automatically scanned. And every time that you pull any image is uh, again uh, scanned. So you can enforce this also uh, who is having, uh, or not who, but the, which specific uh, components in your architecture is performing what through Azure policy. And you can enforce, um, who is uh, getting access, find great access with the use of Active, active Directory, direct to the cluster. You can get some app telemetry and container health, real-time log analytics with Azure Monitor. Even you, even uh, with Azure Monitor, uh, sorry, with uh, log analytics, you can get some Prometheus uh, <clears throat> logs directly in uh, Azure Monitor. So it's uh, really well uh, uh, integrated with different Azure services, but also with open source uh, or third party tools that are not uh, natively deployed on Azure. You also can, uh, or one of the most common uh, use cases is uh, use Kubernetes in uh, data scientist in a box, so you can combine these um, when you are training some models, for example, with um, machine learning experimentation or with cognitive services. Uh, if it's needed that the, the model needs to be run and it has a really, really um, high workload, so you can deploy this on AKS and you can implement MLOps in that sense, with the use of Azure pipelines together with uh, uh, AKS and uh, the cognitive services or the machine learning experiments. So all these uh, machine learning images, you can also uh, deploy it to the Azure Container Registry and deploy whatever image uh, there and just pull it to your cluster. So in that sense, when you use uh, MLOps, you can uh, provide the full life cycle of uh, one experiment of one um, model with AKS. You also uh, can use uh, AKS in scalable internet of things solution. Example with the use with IoTH devices, which take the telemetry and all this information in uh, time series uh, formats from, with IoT Hub, and then connect this directly uh, to AKS and use some of the specific databases, like the most common will be like uh, either uh, Postgres or Cosmos DB for. Uh, sorry, the most common is Cosmos DB for document databases, which uh, it will, or time series. So then you can get all this telemetry and in, in your database together with the application in the AKS cluster. You, another very popular uh, scenario is the data streaming part. So you, if you are getting a lot of data from I, some IoT sensors, then you can have an API management for your services, but you can also uh, interface this with uh, some AKS integration. You can use Cosmos DB to get all the, all the data that is needed to analyze and then send uh, directly through some um, Apache Kafka streaming or then HD insights also workloads. You can analyze this as well with Splunk. And then you can use some of the, for example, Redis cache or Postgres database. 
And then final, finally, uh, you can deploy all these together to an app service. So then it, it's, the AKS only helps you, or, or it helps to the ingest and um, treatment of all the data for, uh, for the sensors and it gives you all the power that AKS has for data streaming scenarios. So these are the, the top uh, use cases that we have on Azure. And now I would like to welcome my colleague Henry Agnes, who is of Data Center Lead, who will take us to the customer stories. Henry? Thank you, Jessica. Yes, so I am Henry Agnes. I will tell you a little bit about uh, different real customers uh, from, uh, uh, from the uh, the real Norwegian customers that are using Azure Kubernetes today in production. And I will not go into super much detail into all of them, uh, but I will give you a taste of what it is. And then we will go deeper into the last one because that is actually my own design from before I joined Microsoft. So I'm quite new at Microsoft and I have a a uh, pretty fresh perspective on Kubernetes in production. So I hope you guys will find that uh, interesting. Uh, we will start by talking about Hafslund Net. Uh, so those of you who are in Norway might remember that uh, three, four years ago, there was actually a law that we need to start doing uh, collecting smart utility data uh, from all uh, all different uh, consumers of electricity in Norway. And Hafslund uh, had a, a, the need to then suddenly start processing very large amounts of IoT data. So this data is coming from uh, one and a half million users uh, and they have, they're by law even, have to be able to receive this data. So Hafslund uh, developed their own software for this but they chose uh, Microsoft Azure to host this. And in the process, they, they standardized a lot of how they work with this. So now they also use Kubernetes for a lot of other uh, applications. And their uh, architecture looks a little bit like this. We will not go into details, but as you saw in Jessica's discussions uh, and slides, you uh, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, components around the Kubernetes that Microsoft is also providing. So we have container registry, we have Active Directory, we have the databases, uh, API management, load balancers, and this is very much about uh, the pro benefits that Microsoft can provide to you is that you get a really well designed and scalable Kubernetes environment and you get all of these other services around it. Uh, DNVGL, they uh, have uh, used uh, Kubernetes for quite a while too, and they, uh, they are using the machine learning case that uh, Jessica also mentioned. Uh, they, are, they had a process where training the models took weeks and, and was actually not very optimal. So by, by containerizing all these machine learning uh, training uh, images they were uh, and using uh, Kubernetes with Autoscaler, they were able to, uh, to do this, uh, to turn this uh, process into a very, from a relatively manual process, they managed to get into an automated uh, situation where when you automate things, what you can then do is that you can actually move faster. You, there, the friction to new, do new experiments goes away, and that means that you end up uh, doing more experiments, and the more you experiment, of course, the more you learn. So the NVGL has a very simple uh, system, and this is, again, the power of cloud is that you can pick and choose the components, uh, I wouldn't say it's simple, but it's it's simpler than many others because they are focusing on uh, on just a few different scenarios and they're using the compute capacity in a very flexible manner uh, to get things working. Uh, 
And this is exactly the, the kind of nice thing with Kubernetes is that you can either use one cluster for a very specific functionality or you can use it as a multi-cluster environment. And we'll go into a little bit of details on what you might want to do in those cases. And of course, Ryan will give you even more uh, information. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, you have heard about VIPs. So the NVGL might be a little bit uh, unknown uh, for people, but it's a very big, uh, big uh, producer and consumer. Uh, but VIPs is a really important uh, customer of uh, Microsoft. And uh, from first doing um, VIPs in their own uh, little data center uh, at DNB, when it was part of DNB, VIPs has been upgrading and moving step by step into Kubernetes. And when they became uh, a a separate company uh, with the collaboration of all the other banks, it was a very good uh, place for them to really cut their connection with the DNB, uh, uh, DNB on-prem data center. So VIPS is 100% in cloud and they're using a lot of different uh, Kubernetes components. And again, we see that the power of, uh, of Microsoft's platform is that you can use API management, SQL database, Cosmos, and so on. So VIPS is a very uh, advanced customer uh, of uh, Kubernetes. And this is my uh, contribution to the uh, Kubernetes world. Uh, LCHEP is the biggest uh, electronics retailer in the Nordics, over 400 stores and so on. Most of you will have seen it. Uh, to the right in the picture, you can see a mobile terminal that is being used for selling. And this is actually a tool that is running on Azure Kubernetes. And it will, in fact, be, uh, it is being rolled out in Norway as we speak. So this was, this was last year. Uh, first versions were launched in um, Denmark. And before Easter, uh, Elchip finalized the rollout in Sweden. And right now it's ongoing in Norway. So once the lockdowns are over and LCHIP stores are open, most likely when you go into an LCHIP store, you will be able to uh, see that this tool is being used. And that tool is actually a uh, just a layer on top of hundreds of microservices that LCHIP has created. And those are all hosted on Kubernetes. And since this uh, is uh, such a a critical component uh, in, uh, in the whole sales chain. Uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, needed uh, a lot of different components. There are lots of, um, lots of Microsoft components. There's Cosmos DB, Service Bus, and so on. But in fact, there's also a lot of the components that uh, Jessica mentioned around open source. So at LCHIP, uh, we are using a lot of uh, standardized um, components from, uh, uh, from Azure. There's API management, traffic manager, Azure DNS, and so on. The development environment is using Azure DevOps. Uh, but then inside the cluster, after the traffic comes, uh, uh, comes to the API management where it's authenticated, it hits a ingress controller called traffic, which is a the type of load balancer that uh, that Kubernetes is using. And from traffic, uh, the, the, the 200 microservices that are behind uh, are protected by Linkerd, which is a service mesh, which does encryption and also observability. And this is where we're um, going further than just using the standard out of the box uh, Kubernetes service uh, gets interesting because when you start having a lot of customers and you have very, very high demand on uptime and so on, then you need to be really quick at fixing problems. And that's where Linkerd is a really good tool because you will see, um, see the traffic, you will see where things are failing and so on. And uh, as you can see, 
a lot of uh, Microsoft components, Cosmos DB service bus and so on. So this is very much uh, the kind of uh, systems that, uh, that Ryan and Innofactor can help you build. Uh, but I urge you to uh, consider how complicated you want to make things. This LCHOP architecture actually took uh, a year to build and that's you don't need a year to create a basic Azure Kubernetes service. At least I hope Ryan will tell you that it's faster than that. Uh, but uh, you do need to think about which components you, you need and, and how you, you take it into, uh, into usage. Uh, Kubernetes is a really good platform, but it is complicated and you need to, to choose things. And that's why the services of uh, Innofactor and our other partners are really valuable for you because they will be able to, uh, to uh, on, based on your requirements, build the right kind of platform and the right kinds of integrations. Uh, and with that, uh, that's what I wanted to tell. Uh, Ryan, uh, or Jörn actually, uh, Jörn, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Henry, and also thank you, Jessica, for uh, great presentations, uh, both from the technical perspective, but also some uh, you know, real world working uh, customer references, really amazing. So uh, it's now time to hand it over to uh, our principal consultant, Ryan Ridge. Um, he will talk about how we um, add to centralized Kubernetes management and how we're helping customers deploying Kubernetes with our best practices. And uh, if I'm not surprised, um, Ryan also has a couple of demos to show you. So please um, take it from there, Ryan. All right, excellent. Thank you, Jorn, Jessica, and Henry. Uh, real quick, can everyone see my screen? I just want to make sure you speak yeah. now if you can't. Beautiful. Yes. All right. Again, my name is Ryan Ruho. I'm a principal consultant with Innofactor Norway. And today I wanted to cover with you some of the basic challenges that you may run into when trying to adopt Kubernetes in Azure. And we're going to go over three major topics here. And I'm going to demo where you want to pay attention to these challenges as you are working and thinking about uh, running Kubernetes in Azure. The first thing I can tell you that I would behoove CTOs, CTOs, managers to do with your teams that are looking to adopt Kubernetes is to reduce the friction between them. Uh, one of the biggest issues we run into when trying to get Kubernetes up and running for our clients is the traditional silos that typically exist uh, within IT operations and structures within businesses. Uh, so for instance, um, I'm sharing my screen with you right now and I have an existing Kubernetes service that's running out here. And in this demo, this Kubernetes service is running in its own resource group. The nodes and resources associated with the AKS cluster are running in their own separate resource group. However, I've created a VNet out here that I've mock created as if it was done by a different group, uh, say networking operations, uh, not to take, you know, to say anything bad against them, but in this case, they have done something differently that was outside, say a build pipeline or outside of communication, and they have provided us what we need to get started, but say there's a lack of communication between those teams. Um, so that's how we're gonna start this. And, what will typically happen is, um, is you'll start out deploying, say, an environment. And say I deploy in my environment, I, I go to uh, my build pipelines in Azure DevOps. And I've deployed a new cluster. Everything appears to be working. Everything is all green. But say I have a step within my build pipeline that uh, mysteriously just stops working. In other words, I could have something like uh, everything appears to be in my, my environment. Everything seems to be working fine. But in this particular case, I have a section here for deploying a tool called Istio, which is a service mesh tool just like Linkerd, but it's not showing up correctly. It's not showing up correctly because I'm missing a load balancer in here. Well, if I then look through here, there is no information telling me what to do next. 
So then I have to go and start looking at my cluster uh, manually and looking at the Istio tool itself and say I get all in my Istio namespace where everything is available. And in this case, I'm looking in here and I have a load balancer that looks like it's being deployed, but it's not, and it's sitting in a pending status. Um, in this particular case, I want to describe, sorry, describe the service to find out what's going on. And if I look at my service here, I have an error message in here. And within this particular error message, uh, I'll see in here that I have an authorization failed error. And it's telling me that I'm missing, that I, that I have a particular user, in this case, a service principal, that doesn't have access to the particular networking environment that was originally set up by the networking team. Well, sometimes you'll discover issues like this as you're learning uh, Kubernetes and learning how third-party services are gonna work with Kubernetes. And then you need to have that contact with your other teams, whether it's networking, whether it's a security team, whether it's pure operations. There are so many Azure resources and so many services that Kubernetes can integrate with on a very fundamental level that you need to have communication open with anybody in your operations team and your development teams. They need to be at least talking and hopefully working together. Um, we're gonna resolve this issue here in just a second to show you how that can be resolved. Um, but the next topic that I wanted to go into was run everything in your environment as infrastructure, as code. And part of this error message that I showed you uh, that's running in Kubernetes is why one of the reasons why you want to run infrastructure as code in your environment. So uh, as I stated earlier, we have a build pipeline for deploying all our Azure resources. Um, and what I have done is in Visual Studio Code, I've used a variety of different tools or different, uh, yeah, different solutions to write this build pipeline. I'm using a combination of Azure Bicep for some of the basic Azure resources, and they are parameterized so I can dynamically deploy resources. Same thing for the resource groups, the VNets, everything else in here. Um, the networking team I'm talking about in this case is me screwing up, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, within the pipelines here, I have Azure DevOps YAML pipelines that I'm using to deploy the, the individual uh, resources into Azure, and then to also be responsible for integrating these resources into each other. So everything is in here is, the first time you're looking at this, you, your mind's probably gonna cook a little bit. The point being is though, because I'm tracking everything in here, because I'm programmatically trying to resolve every single issue that I can as far as the pipeline, if I have to go back later, and I have to look at the history of what someone has done or what I have done, something I may have put in place that is wrong, I can very quickly use Azure DevOps to go through my entire code, find out where issues were happening, find out who did it, and then resolve them much quicker than I could if you're doing everything directly through the Azure portal. So next piece, uh, to resolve the issue that was occurring earlier, uh, with Istio, I can tell you specifically what was going on. Uh, the cluster I deployed is using managed identity and I purposely blocked granting the managed identity of the AKS cluster from having access to the primary VNet. And I just frankly blocked it. I didn't, I didn't have it granted permission to do that, which is why it couldn't create the load balancer because it needed access to the VNet uh, within the, uh, the subnet within the VNet that the load balancer needs to be associated with for the AKS cluster and the VM scale states within it. So for instance, if I was resolving this issue with my networking team, 
because I figured out what the problem was specifically. I'd want to then work with them, find a solution, a way to codify it, then go in and update my code and then rerun my pipeline. So then the load balance of Istio would then be configured correctly, have the correct permissions from the AKS cluster to then uh, have Istio running in here on the case cluster correctly. I'm not gonna wait for this to run, but it has been kicked off. And I will move over again real quick here uh, in a couple minutes to show you that it in fact has succeeded and that the load balancer is in here and that it is reporting correctly in here within Kubernetes. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, uh, if you're using Azure policy, which a lot of our customers are rightfully doing so, and it's a very good tool to use. It's there, you know, ensures accountability, ensures security for your environments. If you're working on policy definitions and you have people that are using a lot of infrastructure as code, or deploying Kubernetes, or making a lot of changes, you need to talk to your teams. Uh, there are a lot of policy definitions that you can put in place at a subscription level or a management group level that if you don't tell your teams about it, their standard deployment behavior will start to break, either because you're restricting the ability of not allowing load balancers or forcing types of load balancers or different types of Azure resources that AKS, for instance, is strictly dependent upon. And it also depends on what type of AKS cluster you're trying to deploy. So again, communicate with your teams, please. Last thing I wanna talk about, <clears throat> data storage related to Kubernetes. If there's nothing else you get out of using data storage in Kubernetes, do not store data in the Kates cluster itself. There's nothing else you get out of this talk. Don't do it, please. Save yourself a lot of headache, a lot of strain, and a lot of trouble. And I will demonstrate to you why here in just a second. So when you deploy an AKS cluster uh, by default, you're going to, two resource groups are going to be created for, for an AKS service. You have a resource group for the Kubernetes service itself, and then you'll have a resource group specifically for the resources related to the AKS cluster. One of the things that will happen, say for instance, if I want to install a new app, I'm gonna install PG admin for instance, uh, on my cluster. And I'm installing it in a namespace called PG admin. is starting to create a container. One of the parameters that I've passed to this installation using Helm is to use a storage class called Manage Premium. Now, the AKS clusters by default will have four storage classes, uh, Azure File, Azure File Premium, Default, and Manage Premium. What they're going to do by default is they're going to create either an Azure Storage account with Blob Storage, um, Azure, an Azure file uh, storage account and, uh, excuse me, Azure disk or an Azure file storage account based upon one of these four options, okay? And what will happen is, is that as that pod is being created, it will then dynamically create the disk within the re this resource group where the rest of the AKS nodes are located. Why this is bad is that if I go in here and I deplete, I delete the primary resource group where the Kubernetes service is located, it will obliterate this resource group where it holds the nodes and all these resources without even thinking twice. Um, so your best option is to connect to storage through, uh, you can use custom storage classes and uh, uh, PVCs, I can't remember the full acronym for that right now, but you can attach to Azure Storage Disks and Azure Storage Accounts into either resource groups that sit outside of the cluster 
or you can attach to something like PostgreSQL uh, and Azure, MS SQL and Azure, your own NetApp storage on your environment or NetApp storage in Azure. Just attach your storage that you need to not disappear anywhere, but using the defaults inside uh, your node resource group. All right. And just to show you how quickly that storage will go away. In fact, if it was critical, if I were to delete that namespace PG admin, not only will the pods and the other services be deleted on the cluster, but this dynamically provisioned storage will disappear here in a matter of 30 seconds or so, as soon as uh, the namespace has been uh, obliterated from the cluster. All right. Now, last thing I'm going to check, because it is a live demo, I'm going to check on my load balancer here and see if it has shown up. If it hasn't, then I have to figure out what else is going on here. And I'm getting the same authorization error. And how I normally go about troubleshooting this particular issue is I would normally go about looking for the service principle, in this case, the client, and find out why it still doesn't have authorization over uh, this particular scro scope that's been granted. I have a feeling I know what's going on. It's because of the way that Istio is being uh, managed on this cluster. It's not going to update my Istio configuration unless there is a configuration update. So even though I have updated uh, the roles, in this case, my network contributor role on the AKS cluster, or excuse me, on the VNet that I was dealing with earlier, and I've added here the serve managed service principle of the AKS cluster, Istio will not recognize that. So what I'm gonna have to do here is delete the Istio namespace. And then kick off my deployment again. And by doing so, the Istio namespace will rerun again and it will start fresh and then it will have the, it will use the correct permissions but it'll retry to use those permissions to attach to uh, the VNet and then create the load balancer that it needs to use as a service mesh in this particular environment. If I refresh this now, you'll notice in here that I have my PVC is gone. I have the Kubernetes internal load balancer in here. That should go away and be recreated actually. So, um, we can wait for this later. We're running on time, but I want to move to Q&A right now. So we're as efficient as possible for all of you. So the, ah, I did forget one last thing I wanted to mention since I have some time. A lot of clients will come to us and ask, what is the best possible solution to use for Kubernetes? And I typically send them to this particular page here, landscape.cncf.io slash members. And I tell them to look at any matter of these cards here. And this will tell you the sheer amount of tools that are available out there that are in some way more than likely linked with Kubernetes, orchestration and management, discovery services, et cetera. There isn't necessarily a perfect uh, solution for everything. In fact, there isn't. What there is though, are they are very good solutions for your teams and your companies based upon the skill sets of your team members and uh, your employees. That's where I would, I try to focus my customers to uh, move them in that direction so that they're using solutions that their internal team can support um, and that they can evolve with over time. Uh, going back to the discussion about infrastructure as code, when I have them use these particular tools that they're comfortable with, and then they're deploying everything as infrastructure as code, it also becomes much easier to make incremental changes to their environment. 
uh, if they need to add, for instance, a new process within their deployment configuration, like I have here, and I have resource groups, my AKS cluster, my VNet storage account, and Istio, they have to add or remove something to this process. It becomes very trivial. It doesn't require them to re rethink their entire paradigm of how they're managing the environment. So keep those things in mind. Okay, now I'm done. Q&A guys, back to you, Jorn. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Um, it's uh, really nice to see you just observe um, see through the, the expertise uh, on this really highly technical area. So um, uh, I see people have been a bit um, shy about uh, posting questions, uh, but it is of course possible to uh, raise hand or, or now also to uh, add to the, to the question uh, box, uh, just write down uh, the questions you may have. So in the meantime, um, maybe I can ask you a question, Ryan. So uh, for customers that are you know, looking to explore uh, Kubernetes, do you have any um, uh, recommendations as to you know what kind of steps forward uh, they should consider? Uh, steps forward, I would consider. Um, first of all, I would uh, you know speak to. We'll be gladly to speak to any of our clients, and of course, please speak to uh, Henry or Jessica as well, as they are expertise in this area. And the first thing I'd want to know is what is the problem you're trying to solve, and uh, then depending upon the problem they're trying to solve, see if it's a good fit for the solution. And then I start breaking things down from there to determine, okay, um, if this is the, the path you wanna go, how can we do this? So it says uh, minimal management and effort as possible using their existing skill sets on their teams and tools that are available to them, either that are open source or available through Microsoft. Yeah, great. Uh, Jessica, Henry, any comments to that uh, question? No, I would uh, agree with Ryan. The important thing really is to understand what problem you're solving. And uh, Kubernetes can be a really good solution, but it's also one of those solutions that sometimes technical people want to do because it's really cool. So, so make sure that you are using it for the right reasons. Good thing. We received another question uh, here now. So uh, why the choice of uh, Bicep compared to other solutions? I decided to use Bicep in here just to, to give some uh, viewability to it. It's such a, a new tool that's out there, but it's something that Microsoft is putting a lot of effort and time behind. Um, and frankly, it as it's evolving to become as flexible as ARM templates, it also reduces a lot of code that you have to manage. So as the support for Bicep gets better, and some of the features they have updated recently include uh, four loops or using loops so you can cr dynamically create multiple resources in Azure. Um, yeah, that's going to be the paradigm that I think uh, if you're working with purely Azure resources, uh, just to get basic resources out there, that's probably the way a lot of people are going to go, especially for managed services in Azure. Um, I use a lot of uh, custom solutions as well. That's why I use a lot of Azure CLI and Bash for the Kubernetes integration, uh, especially for this particular demo, um, because it's quick and there isn't a lot of real, um, especially for something like Istio, there, there isn't, uh, they're dropping support for Helm. So it doesn't make sense to use Helm to show deployment with, with Istio. But for other solutions that are integrated with Kubernetes, I could have used something like Helm for the integration. So. Yeah, great. Uh, another question. Sorry, loaded question. Yeah. Um, yeah, right, another question. Do you support graph database, uh, databases in Azure? Yes, we do. So I would recommend that you have a look at Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB actually has the same backend, but very many different um, APIs for how you can request that data. And that's what makes Cosmos DB really cool, plus a lot of other good features around um, reliability and uh, SLAs on requests and so on. 
uh, but you can you can do graph uh, requests in uh, for Cosmos DB too. So it it's actually kind of nice. And the specific API that we have is uh, Gremlin, so you can use that uh, as a graph database. Correct. On Cosmos. Yeah. Uh, another question um, here that's for me since for people can take their time to uh, to write more more questions um maybe to you henry from uh, your time at uh, elchep uh, so um what uh, did you feel were the biggest uh, obstacles uh, towards you know building a platform in kubernetes i think that for us it was um that we were in the middle of a big project at the same time so we had to do a move uh, step by step and without interrupting anything so we had to move quite carefully um, another thing that because we we were what i didn't mention was that we were actually already using azure web apps so we were in azure we had a modern software platform um, what we had to then do was to actually use a lot of these uh, different open source components from the uh, screen that Ryan was showing uh, to replace some of the built-in functionality that exists in Azure Web Apps because Azure Web Apps are actually quite good uh, for basic uh, systems but then when you want uh, to be have like one pane of glass for uh, management when you want uh, better scalability properties and so on uh, then uh, that, that's what and price because we were using a lot of money on, on web apps so then, then Kubernetes made sense for us. Uh, but that was also exactly like uh, Ryan and I commented earlier that really uh, know that you are you need Kubernetes. Uh, that that was what we spent a lot of time on before we started the journey. A, a follow-up question. So uh, there's a lot of. Um changes happening to the kubernetes area so how do you keep track on that in terms of um, of uh, you know keeping or maintaining the staff updated uh, on competence that's a mm. really good question uh, the it's a lot about uh, own motivation too of course uh, as long if you're using uh, um, mostly uh, azure kubernetes uh, we uh, we will actually support the old way of doing things and we will gently start warning uh, for over a year so we, for instance uh, we are uh, right now we are go we have announced very recently that we will uh, stop supporting a feature called the uh, pod security policy uh, and we are re replacing that with uh, with some uh, something but we've actually not finalized that but we've announced it already now and then uh, we are already committing ourselves to supporting uh, the old pod security policies for over a year and then uh, then that uh, and but you will in the next version of kubernetes you will start getting warnings when you're deploying a pod security policy that says that we are about to um, deprecate this and and i would say that that's kind of uh, common nowadays that uh, when you are doing this uh, that kubernetes really tries to run and then you just have to to follow up on the logs and the warnings to make sure that uh, that you follow those recommendations and of course in uh, azure we have the recommendation engine which will also give you some advice if uh, it detects that you have an old configuration or so on I just want to follow up on what Henry is saying real quick or piggyback. The I recently updated a, a client's kids cluster that I had originally or had updated Easter of last year. It was running on Kubernetes 1.15.3 and updated it to 1.20.4, I think. And I did that over the Easter weekend. I spent four hours just going through the existing code base I had to make sure there are no major changes. Went on the, uh, you know, went online, researched any updates between the two changes, made a couple of modifications based upon some things I found, tore down the old cluster, redeployed the new one. Because again, you segregate the case cluster from anything else that is 
uh, that you can't lose data on, the update itself took 15 minutes. The research took four hours. So that's not a horrible time investment to completely tear down and redeploy uh, a case cluster. And I was also able to determine, you know, if the DR process I had in place for that was working as well. So even though it may seem like a massive investment, I would say it is upfront, but then managing it over time, it becomes very, very manageable. Yeah, that's the power of uh, of having things scripted uh, because you will then know exactly what you have running and it's easy to verify. Yep. So there's still a room for a couple of more questions, guys, and if you want to write. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, um, so uh, now we've seen that um, there are a lot of things changing, happening around the Kubernetes space, um, but uh, what are the future trends? Uh, where is this uh, heading? Uh, I can comment that uh, the Kubernetes project in the Cloud Native Foundation is changing uh, really fast. A lot of new projects are coming, but you can uh, be updated on that uh, following the formal roadmap that is publicly to everyone. Uh, in Microsoft, we have also the public roadmap of Azure Kubernetes service on public on GitHub. So everyone can go and follow in, in that um, uh, roadmap. So then you can see which features are coming, which are been uh, already on preview and what are uh, generally available already. So in that sense, uh, we as, uh, let's say, developers of companies that are customers that are planning to use uh, Azure Kubernetes service can, can check which features that maybe I'm not support yet uh, are coming, or e even you can request uh, the feature in the public roadmap. I will share the link on that uh, in the chat so everyone can see it. That's excellent. <clears throat> Any other uh, comments, uh, Henry or uh, Ryan? Well, I think that the um, Kubernetes has uh, grown a lot and grows a lot, uh, but it's starting to be more stable. So now is a good time to look into Kubernetes. And uh, I think that what's happening is that it's becoming more and more mature. It means that it's always getting easier and easier to use. So you, you get, start to be in a position that it takes much shorter time to become comfortable in it. And uh, um, configurations by default are quite good so uh, you don't have to to do as much work as you might have done uh, even uh, some months or years ago one thing i'd like to mention uh to add what henry said if you're looking at all if you're looking out there at the cncf and the landscape and you're like oh my god there's so many shiny objects out here where do i start with start with the basics first you know Kubernetes and tools to manage Kubernetes. And if you're worried about like, well, is this tool going to be around for a year from now? Um, when you go to GitHub, look at how old the project is, look how many people are following it, how many maintainers there are, how long was this till they made their last updates, how many updates they're doing, how many issues are they looking at and resolving? See how active the project is out there. And unlike you know traditional proprietary software, that you know you we used to always have to use with open source software you can see the trends on where people are putting their effort and time into to help you make better decisions on determining is this going to be here for at least another two to three years and and from that standpoint um you have more flexibility to make more informed decisions I see that time is flying in good company, and um, I um, think it's time for us to wrap up. Um, thank you for our presenters for sharing their best practices and uh, really thoughtful insights. Uh, and also thank you everyone for your attendance. Uh, the webinar will be made uh, available later um, on the Factors YouTube channel, and we'll send the slides uh, via email. So everyone, have a great day, and thank you for attending.